Welcome to the Benzo Free Podcast, your home for an honest, straightforward, and personal discussion about anti-anxiety drugs, their effects, and how to deal with dependence and withdrawal. Whether you have taken benzodiazepines, Z drugs, or any other tranquilizers, know someone who has, or you just want help dealing with chronic anxiety and insomnia, this is your podcast. I'm your host, D.E. Foster, author of the book, Benzo Free, The World of Anti-Anxiety Drugs and the Reality of Withdrawal. I'm so glad you joined us today. Please stick around and let me bend your ear for a few minutes. It just might feel a little better on the other side. Hello there, this is your host D, and welcome to episode 7 of the Benzo Free Podcast. Mm, it's been a great week around here, actually. I say that because um, I'm getting more and more feedback, and that is that feels good. <laughs> In fact, I actually have comments, questions, and even a Benzo story to share with you today, so that's that's really helping out. People are actually listening to this podcast, and you know, that is cool. Thanks. If if you can spread the word, anybody else you know who's struggling with benzos, anybody else you know who might benefit, caregivers, medical people, whatever, that you think might be interested, please pass it along. Um, the more people we get listening, the longer I can keep doing this. So I appreciate your help. Today we are going to follow our normal format, which is starting off with our intro. And then we're going to jump into our mailbag, our benzo news and benzo story. And then on to our feature, which today is dedicated to Professor Ashton and the Ashton Manual. I decided to put one whole episode as that feature for her manual. It's definitely that important and, and deserves it. So I, I hope you'll stay tuned for that part. And since I have a lot of feedback and lots to share on this episode, you know what? I'm going to cut this intro short and we're going to get right to things. Well, that is right after these two quick points of business. First off, remember that we need feedback. Um, so please, either comment on this episode or even better, visit our feedback form at benzofree.org slash feedback. I like your questions, comments, changes, you name it. I want to hear it. And remember that the Benzo Free podcast is for informational purposes only and should never be considered medical advice. The views and opinions expressed by our listeners and interview guests on this podcast, whether read from textual submissions or presented in their own voice, do not necessarily reflect those of the Benzo Free Podcast or its host. See, that wasn't so hard. Let's move on to our mailbag. Da -da 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 -da, our mailbag. <laughs> I said I might put some theme music in. Trust me, I promise that will not be the ongoing theme music. <laughs> I'll find something or some sound effect maybe to make these transitions a little more interesting. We'll see how that goes. I have two questions and a comment for you today, so let's jump right into it here. The first question is, can you tell me when the podcast episodes will be released each week? Ah, this question was submitted by Elizabeth in the comments for episode five. Thank you, Elizabeth. I... This was an oversight on my part, so I'm really glad you brought this to my attention. I don't really post the ongoing schedule anywhere on the website, and um, I haven't talked about it on the podcast. So let's fix that. I've already added something to the podcast homepage, and now I'm going to share it with you here. Here's the way it was originally scheduled and the way it laid out. Um, I released the first five episodes um, all together on Wednesday, February 21st. The next week, this week, I am doubling up on episodes. I released episode 6 on Tuesday, February 26th, and releasing this one, episode 7, on Thursday, February 28th. Maybe Friday, we'll see how quickly I can get it edited. Starting next week, we will be on our regular weekly schedule going forward. A new episode will be released every Wednesday. Depending on the speed as which the providers such as, you know, Apple Music, Stitcher, Google Play, Spotify, TuneIn approve them for listing on their directories, they will show up there either Wednesday and sometimes Thursday. These providers can take up to 24 hours to update their content. I hope that answers that question. And again, thanks for reminding me, Elizabeth. I appreciate it. Next question is more scientific. What are GABA receptors? I keep reading about them online, but I still don't really understand what they are or how they work. Okay, 
This can be really complicated, but I'm going to really try to shorten it up and make it as user-friendly as possible for here. I'm going to use a few highlights from my book. So if you want a lot of detail, you can check that out. But for now, let's just cover a real high level, okay? Please keep in mind, I'm not a medical professional nor a scientist, so this is just my layman's explanation of it. The government health system in New South Wales, Australia, kind of explained benzodiazepines' effect on the body this way. Quote, benzodiazepines slow down the workings of the brain and the central nervous system, end quote. You see, when it, when it comes to brain communication, there are two opposing systems, glutamate and GABA. Glutamate stimulates, basically makes you more excited, more anxious, and GABA inhibits, making you calmer, more laid back. And together, they regulate the level of excitability in the brain. Perhaps the website addictionblog.org said it best. They said, quote, Think of glutamate as the gas pedal. It excites things into action. GABA, on the other hand, puts on the brakes, end quote. I like that one. That one really, I think, sums it up concisely, although simplified, <laughs> but concise. Now, there's one more piece to this puzzle real quick, which is the GABA receptors. And this is the part of the neuron that can receive these GABA neurotransmitters, okay? It's kind of like the docking station for the GABA UPS service or messaging service. You know, when they come in, they need a docking station to receive the message. Only neurons with GABA receptors can be influenced by this calming effect of GABA. And if those receptors become damaged, then the nerve cells may not receive the calming message. Make sense? Good. I hope I'm not being too basic here. I know this is the way I would explain it to me, so please don't think I'm dumbing it down for everybody. I'm not trying to. I just know, for me, it took me a while to really absorb this and understand it, and this is how I would like it described. So I hope this is okay with everybody. But now let's talk about how benzos affect this, okay? Benzos enhance the actions of GABA, meaning they increase the inhibitory effect, that calming effect of GABA on the neurons, therefore calming the brain and central nervous system even more than they normally would. That's what gives you the benefit of these drugs when you take them. But the longer that this happens, the more your body adapts to the effect. Let me just touch on homostasis really quick because that's important here. Homostasis is the human body's tendency towards physiological stability. So when a new drug is introduced into your body, your physiology changes according to the effects of that drug. And through homeostasis, the body tends to rebalance itself to find new stability. This process can often reduce the effects of the drug, which leads to the need for stronger doses. Your body becomes dependent and you enter tolerance. As your body adapts to the benzodiazepine, it down-regulates the GABA receptors, decreasing their sensitivity. So that docking station that's getting ready to receive that GABA message is now closed most of the time. It can't receive the message as much anymore. Thus, when a person attempts to withdraw, all these physiological changes are exposed, which results in this rebound effect. Your GABA receptors now have a diminished capacity to receive calming messages and the body suffers from overexcitability, thus the benzo withdrawal syndrome. This homostasis process kicks in, but as before, the process takes time, sometimes weeks, months, or even years. Eventually, stability is reached again, and the withdrawal symptoms subside, and the body turns to normal. But in addition, there's one other quick thing, and that is what Ashton calls a learning deficit. I find this really active in my own recovery. <laughs> But while we were on benzos, the drugs aided in our response to stress, both physiologically and psychologically. We didn't have to develop or learn coping mechanisms to handle anxiety. When the drug was removed, this learning deficit is exposed, and we have to create new brain pathways to manage the worries and complications of ordinary life. So that on top of the damage to our GABA receptors. So I'm going to stop there. I hope this was helpful. Please note that the effect benzos have on GABA receptors is only part of the overall picture. Several other players may also play a part, such as acetylcholine, dopamine, serotonin, CRF concentrations, glutamate, even something called hyperventilation syndrome might play a part in this. So just because we understand the, the role that GABA plays doesn't mean we have the whole picture. And our third item in the mailbag is a comment. Um, I received the following comment about the discussion on doctors in our last episode titled Dependence, Disbelief, and the Doctor Dilemma. This one comes from Michelle. I, I hope that I pronounced that right in Alexandria, Virginia. 
She had a similar experience with Doctors I Did Catherine, who triggered our topic last episode. I'm going to share a few excerpts of her comment here. Michelle shares the following, quote, You are very fortunate in your experiences with doctors. When I was going through acute benzo withdrawal, my doctors treated me like a criminal. They accused me of having taken more than was prescribed, and then they accused me of having conversion disorder. They treated me like I was paranoid. I was told that benzo withdrawal symptoms only last a few weeks. I went through absolute hell for 14 months and have debilitating symptoms to this day, although I have had improvements. The only good thing to come of this is that I vowed I would make a difference for other people and change the way the medical system treats patients like me. Now I'm halfway through an MSW program and intend to go back to the HMO the next time with LCSW credentials and copies of work on benzo damage that I will eventually publish and lay it out there for them again, this time from the standpoint of a mental health professional who has been iatrogenically harmed. End quote. Thank you, Michelle, um, for sharing your experiences here. I really appreciate it. I hope I did it justice as I read excerpts from your comment. You know, I, I wish that everyone could have a positive, empathetic experience with a medical caregiver when they go through benzo withdrawal, but I mean, I wish that was the case, but it's not. While I still believe that benzo withdrawal should not be attempted without the supervision of a licensed physician, I realize that this is far easier said than done for many people. And I wish to hell I had a better answer for them. I'll just leave it at that. Thank you again, Michelle. I really appreciate your comment. And let's move on to Benzo News. Um, our Benzo News section today has one news item, and this one was one I came across a couple of days ago on the Benzodiazepine Information Coalition's blog. This is a delicate topic, but one I don't think I can shy away from. It's something we have to address head on, I believe. And it was written by its founder, Janice Curl, and it's titled, Want to Prevent Suicides? Stop Ignoring Benzo Patients. It was posted on the BIC blog on February 15th. You can read it on their website at benzoinfo.com or, of course, in the show notes, I have a direct link to the article there. I, I must place a trigger warning here about both the article itself and my coverage in our news section. If this is a concern for you, please skip over the news section and rejoin us later. This was a very powerful article, Janice. Thank you. It's a subject that we so often dance around. Uh, afraid to truly address, but Janice doesn't dance here. She dives in head first, and um, thank you for that. Janice opens with a quote from Pulitzer Prize winning author David Foster Wallace, which describes depression and hopelessness better than any I've read of late. And then she explains about the struggles of benzo patients with suicidal ideation. She shared several studies which illuminate the increased risk of suicide associated with usage of benzodiazepines. But it's her direct experiences with those she met in online patient support groups, which are the most shocking. She said the following, quote, The suicides are so numerous that it is hard to keep track. The count is over 200 now in the almost five years since I joined the groups, and these are just the ones I can document. Having spoken to many of them, I know they didn't want to die. They sounded just like me, unbelievably sick, wanting to get better, and planning and anticipating healthier and happier futures, end quote. Janice also shares some very helpful tips for preventing benzo suicides in this article. And I just want to thank her for covering this too often ignored side of the benzo crisis. Please remember that if you are suicidal or know someone who is, please get professional help. Our website has a list of suicide resources around the world on our resources page at benzofree.org slash resources. Please check that out if you are having problems with this or you know somebody who is. Take suicidal ideation seriously. And that'll move us on to Benzo Stories. We actually have one today, as I mentioned in the opening. I know you may faint when I say that. It's not going to be me talking about another anecdote or story that I want to share. This one's from a listener just like you. Like many Benzo stories, it may be hard to hear. And I probably should put another trigger warning here since it is a detailed account of struggles with benzos and benzo withdrawal. So if this is an issue for you, please skip over this section too, perhaps. I promise that the Ashton Manual feature won't be full of trigger warnings, okay. 
But just as I said when I shared my story in episode two, I think sharing these stories actually helps to connect us together. So many of us feel so alone and so isolated during this time. I feel a little less alone when I hear someone else's story about their experience with benzos. And I hope you feel that way too, and that's why I'm sharing these here. This one is from Cheryl, who lives in the great state of Kansas, USA. I am quite familiar with that state. I grew up just outside of Kansas City on the Kansas side, and I've driven throughout the state more times than I can count. Um, so I have this picture in my head of, you know, wheat fields blowing in the breeze, tumbleweeds, farmhouses, and idyllic little small towns. So <laughs> that's kind of the picture I have as I hear her words. She says, quote, I just ran across your podcast and I have listened to the first three. My story. I'm 57. I have been on Xanax for 33 years, basically my entire adult life. I have two grown children and five grandchildren. A very supportive husband, a wonderful, hardworking, easygoing man of few words. We live in a very rural area of southeast Kansas. My first panic attack was when I was seven. I really don't know how I made it through school. I had to learn how to hide my panic. No one knew about it, not friends or family. After my children were born, I finally couldn't cope, so I went to my doctor and he put me on Xanax. Finally, I could relax. I started working at a mental health clinic where I started talking to the staff and psychiatrist. I have been to the Mayo Clinic in Scottsdale, KU Med Center, doctors in Tulsa, and so many therapists and counselors that I can't remember all of them. I was taking up to 8 milligrams a day until about 18 months ago. I was also on Ambien, Buspirin, and Amipramine. I was transferred to another counselor who said I needed to get off of it. I'm now down to 4.5 milligrams a day of Xanax, and I'm still on the others. No one ever told me about these drugs. I, like you, finally started to do research while going from 5 down to 4.5, and suddenly I started feeling symptoms of withdrawal. Now, along with yet another therapist, we are continuing the taper. But she wants me to wait another couple of weeks before tapering down because of the symptoms. I know I have a long way to go. I have been housebound since the 1st of February. I have been relying on my faith to get me through this. I am already on disability since 1997, and I'm really thankful for that, but the panic disorder is what I get disability for. I could go on and on, but I'm sure you have heard it all before. My taper is going to be long and slow at first, to see how I handle it. I made my first taper by myself, and it was too much for me. My doctor told me I could go back up by a quarter milligram, but I didn't want to do it, so I didn't. When I get through this with the grace of God, I want to help others. I appreciate you and what you are doing. I think the handling of this medication is one of the most underestimated and uninformed there is. Keep up the good work. I'll be listening and reading your book, and God bless you. Cheryl. End quote. Okay, give me just a sec. Sorry. <laughs> one of the things I don't prepare for is my own emotions when I read someone else's story. So... I, I just want to say that um, uh, that Cheryl's story wasn't unique. I wish it was, but as most of us know, this is not the case. Thank you, Cheryl, so very much for sharing your story with us. And I hope by sharing it, we can connect and help others. Just take care of yourself and, and taper slowly. You're doing great. And, and you know what? Catch up with us again. We want to know how you're doing. So let us know how things are going. All right. Let's move on to our feature from all that. Our feature today is on Professor C. Heather Ashton and the Ashton Manual. Be, before I get too far into all the niceties that I'm going to be sharing, I want to let people know that just in case you want to reach out to Professor Ashton, that she is now fully retired and unable to respond to personal inquiries. Let me share the following with you, which is from the website benzo.org.uk, where the Ashton Manual is hosted. It says, quote, Please be advised that Professor Ashton is now fully retired and no longer based at Newcastle University. She is therefore unable to deal with personal email inquiries with regard to benzodiazepine-related problems. 
Please also note that Professor Ashton does not support or endorse any internet support group, end quote. And that also includes Benzo Free, my own group here. So um, even though I believe she would be proud of the work we do here, of course, there is no endorsement from her. And I totally understand why she's retired and taking care of herself and spending time with her family. And I totally respect that. And I wish her well. I also want to let you know that I have used various resources in telling her story here. And just so you know, links, of course, to them uh, will be in the show notes. So please check them out. As many of you are aware, your hosts, in addition to Benzo Free as a whole, support the Ashton Manual and recognize the number of lives she and her manual have saved over the past many years. But that being said, I realize that to an outsider, our praise of Professor Ashton may appear nearing the levels of, you know, worship or something. I want you to know that I am a very skeptical man, actually, and, and try to be as objective as I can in most situations. While I don't intentionally seek to find the faults in people, I do go in with my eyes wide open. You know, I'm sure it seems like we are worshiping some idol or false idol here, but but nothing could be further from the truth. Almost every Benzo charity and support organization that I have come across supports the Ashton Manual as the primary, if not only, resource for successful Benzo withdrawal. And, and that wouldn't happen if it wasn't so effective, if her work didn't mean so much. It does. And that's why we talk so much about Professor Ashton and about her manual. It's almost universal. So while I'll admit this feature topic may come across kind of as a lifetime achievement award speech, you know, for Professor Ashton, I, I can honestly tell you that for those of us who are still alive today because of her work, it is not in any way undeserved. So let's talk about the woman herself, first of all. Professor Ashton is a graduate of the University of Oxford, and she obtained a first-class honors degree in physiology in 1951, received her postgraduate doctor of medicine degree in 56. Then she qualified as a member of the Royal College of Physicians London in 58 and became a fellow of that group in 75. She was also a National Health Service consultant in both clinical psychopharmacology in 1975 and psychiatry in 1994. She spent much of her career at the University of Newcastle upon Tyne. In 1965, she started as a researcher. And she also was a lecturer, senior lecturer, reader, and professor and clinician. She started in the Department of Pharmacology and later in the Department of Psychiatry. And her research there centered on the effects of psychotropic drugs on the brain and behavior. And more recently, she is a patron of the Bristol and District Tranquilizer Project and has been involved in the UK organization Victims of Tranquilizers. She has submitted evidence about benzodiazepines to the House of Commons Health Select Committee. And there's even a Facebook page dedicated her titled Tribute to Professor Heather Ashton. <laughs> Regarding publications, she has published about 250 papers in professional journals and books on psychotropic drugs, 50 of them concern benzodiazepines. But most of her experience came from her clinical work. Professor Ashton ran a withdrawal clinic within the British National Health Service for 12 years. She studied the histories of over 300 patients and closely followed their progress. Professor Ashton shares this about her time there. Quote, for 12 years, I ran a benzodiazepine withdrawal clinic for people wanting to come off their tranquilizers and sleeping pills. Much of what I know about this subject was taught to me by those brave and long-suffering men and women. It is interesting that the patients themselves, and not the medical profession, were the first to realize that long-term use of benzodiazepines can cause problems. End quote. When Professor Ashton closed her clinic in 1994 to retire, there was no one to take it over to continue her work. In 1995, she submitted a research proposal to the Medical Research Council in the UK to, quote, investigate the link between long-term benzodiazepine use and permanent brain damage, end quote. Her proposal was rejected. In a letter written by Wayne Douglas, co-founder of World Benzodiazepine Awareness Day, or WBAD, Regarding the nomination of Professor Ashton for Queen's Honors, he said the following of his good friend, quote, 
I came to know Heather as an incredibly learned woman with broad knowledge in areas not only concerning medicine, but also philosophy, science, literature, poetry, religion, history, and the like. And despite this, she was always so humble and approached people on a personal level that they felt comfortable with, end quote. He also shared the following about her experience with the patients in her clinic. Quote, Running a benzodiazepine withdrawal clinic under the NHS for 10 years, Heather was a compassionate doctor with traditional values. She sat and listened to patients, which enriched her knowledge about the implications of prescribed benzodiazepines. As humble and gracious as she is, Heather has always been very quick to point out that it was the patients themselves who first became aware of the risks associated with these drugs, giving them the most credit. End quote. And also speaking of World Benzodiazepine Awareness Day, it might be interesting to note that the date is set for July 11th. That's Professor Ashton's birthday. Now, that, let's look at the manual itself, okay? The official title of the manual is actually Benzodiazepines, How They Work and How to Withdraw. But most people in the benzo community refer to it as the Ashton Manual. This manual is completely free. That's amazing, completely free, and it can be found online at benzo.org.uk slash manual. You can also get to it via our website on our Ashton page, which is at benzofree.org slash Ashton. There are four chapters in the manual. Chapter one is the benzodiazepines, what they do in the body. Chapter two, how to withdraw from benzodiazepines after long-term use. Chapter three, slow withdrawal schedules. And chapter four, benzodiazepine withdrawal symptoms, acute and protracted. I have to admit, chapter four is where I spent most of my time looking up symptoms, trying to find out, is this in here? And is this related to the benzos? And most of the time, it was. You know, some people I've talked to are actually afraid to read the Ashton Manual. Some are afraid of what it might say. It might be too negative or depressing or, or even be boring. And if that's how you feel, I beg you to reconsider, because the most surprising thing about her manual to me, despite the negative subject matter, is how uplifting it is. She is very optimistic that anyone, given the right information and planning, can withdraw from benzodiazepines. For those who want to learn more about Professor Ashton and the work she has done, please take a look at the show notes for several links. One of the great ones I came across was um, on the site for benzo.org.uk, which is, of course, home of the Ashton Manual, as I mentioned. It is a web page with over 60 links to articles, studies, and speeches by and about Professor Ashton and her work. And it also hosts the Ashton Manual in several languages. You know, I never met nor spoke to Professor Ashton directly. I, I wish I had. But I believe that I owe not only my sobriety, but my new life to her. I do correspond with various people in the Benzo community from time to time, some people who have known Professor Ashton personally and had shared thoughts with me. These following words of advice and encouragement are ones that I believe with, with some confidence that she'd be okay if I shared. And they are these. Safe and complete withdrawal is possible, but you have to go very, very slowly. If a doctor urges abrupt withdrawal, Run. Run a mile. Find a good doctor to supervise the process. And pay attention to diet, exercise, lifestyle, and loving support from family. I think it's best to close this, um, this feature on Professor Ashton with words from her herself. And this is from the 2011 supplement to the Ashton Manual. She says the following, quote, it is important to remember that by far the greatest majority of long-term benzodiazepine users do recover from withdrawal given time. Even protracted symptoms tend to decrease gradually, sometimes over years. The individual needs to know that the actual drug withdrawal is only the first step towards recovery. It may be followed by a prolonged period of convalescence during which the damage caused to the person's body and often to his whole life, needs to be repaired as far as possible. But the brain, like the rest of the body, has an enormous capacity for adapting and self-healing. That is how life survives and how ex-benzodiazepine, quote, addicts 
can be optimistic about their future, end quote. I realize, like I said in the opening, that this may this praise may feel misguided to some, but I just got to tell you, it's not. Until you have been through the ordeal of Benza withdrawal and found yourself so desperate for information and guidance, you'll never know the type of life raft that this manual has meant to us. Professor Ashton, thank you. And let's get on to our closing. Please bear with me for about 25 seconds for our disclaimer. This podcast is for informational purposes only and should not be considered medical advice in any way. The host of this podcast is not a medical professional, nor is he engaged in rendering medical health or psychological advice, nor any other kind of personal or professional services. Withdrawal, tapering, or any change in dosage of benzodiazepines, non-benzodiazepines, theanodiazepines, or any other prescription drug should only be done under the direct supervision of a licensed physician. Our full disclaimer can be viewed on our website at benzofree.org slash disclaimer. Uh, and our next episode is episode 8, and it will be released next Wednesday. I don't know the topic yet, but, you know, we'll figure it out between now and then. Any suggestions? <laughs> Thank you again for joining me today, and please, let me know how we did. Keep calm, taper slowly, and, you know, take care of yourself. I'll see you next time.